Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. It's quite cool, isn't it? Just, I'm just going to get comfy with my surroundings, have a little wander. I've got, I've got some chairs. Anyone want to come over for some tea? Uh, and you guys, how did you get here? Is it like a VIP lounge? You knew the bouncer or something? It's pretty cool. So that's good. You're going you're gonna to see a whole new angle from there. I don't know. I think this is the best angle. But these guys are clear. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Right. Let's start with my very well-planned talk. <laughs> yeah, poor Mark. What are you going to talk about? I don't know. I'm a bit gutted, actually, that so many of you were in Dusseldorf in 2011. I don't think my talk has changed since then. <laughs> I'm joking. Of course, it's a brand new talk. It's a complete new talk. Um, I'm going to start my talk with a question. Are you ready for the question? Are we in the future yet? No? I know hoverboards. Anyway, are we? Well, I can uh, answer that question for you because I made a website called areweinthefutureyet.com <laughs> and uh, the answer is yes, we are. We are actually in the future. How do I know? You might be asking me. Well, this is a screenshot from the original Back to the Future film and you can see that when they went uh, back to the future, they went to the date, November the 4th, uh, 2014. 10 past 10, I think that is actually, obviously I timed this talk very well, um, because that is actually, right now, we... <laughs> we are actually in the future right now. And I should just say that um, a few years ago, you might have seen like every, it was every few months, wasn't it? Someone got Photoshop out, they took this screenshot from the film and they put it in today's date and they're like, yeah, it's the future. It's like, okay, I'm sick of these fakes now. I thought, well, why don't I just make a website that can just make a fake for you uh, every single minute of every single day? And here it is. So this is JavaScript, a bit of Canvas stuff. I just put the, I don't actually know what the original date was in Back to the Future. I've got no idea. Oh, look, did you see it changed? It's 10, you can use this as a clock. Actually, it's, it all works. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd, that was a good start, wasn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> I am a digital artist. That's kind of a fancy title. Um, what does this mean? Well, I'm, I, you know, I make stuff with code. This is how I started learning to program on the Commodore PET, a uh, very early home computer. My dad brought it home from where he worked. Um, Computers in those days, they had a bit of an attitude. They didn't, like, they didn't have any friendly start buttons. You can open all your apps. It was just like this thing, this prompt. Like, to, it's just, to me, this computer is just going, what? It's like, it, it doesn't do it, it doesn't offer you anything. It's like, well, what do you do? Well, I had to learn to do programming. Um, oh, here's Commodore 64. Anyone have a Commodore 64? Yeah, they're pretty cool, aren't they? I thought maybe, well, you know, I often do some live coding, but I thought today I'd do some live coding on a Commodore 64. What do you think about that? Yeah? Yeah, I'm going to make, because I'm a digital artist, yeah? Uh, I'm going to make some digital art on a Commodore 64. Yeah? Oh, <laughs> thank you both. Uh, <laughs> Okay, see, I obviously don't have a real Commodore 64, I'm afraid to say, but I have this virtual one. This is good. Right, so who's good at Commodore Basic? Anyone? I suppose you all remember this, right? 10 prints, what shall I say? Hello, Berlin. Woo. Yeah? Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, 20. Are you ready for this? Go to 10. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I've got years of experience, so you might not be able to do this uh, on your own, but uh, here we are. Yes, there you go. That's pretty cool. Whoa. <laughs> At this point, I have to do this because there isn't a run-stop run key <laughs> on my computer. How do you edit code on the car? Actually, it's really funny. Like, if I type too fast, it doesn't work. 
<laughs> it's like the computer is too slow for my typing. I know. Right, now there's this other thing on the Commodore 64. If I put in a semicolon, that annoys, well, first of all, it annoys the JavaScript programmers, but second of all, it's, uh, it stops it doing a new line every time, right? So it just fills up the entire screen. Okay, right. So <laughs> I can tell you're slightly underwhelmed. Right, let's see. Okay, now on the Commodore, there were also like graphics characters. Have you seen how I'm editing this, by the way? I just move the cursor to, <laughs> to where I want and I just can type over it. It's brilliant. Yeah? All right. You can actually have like special characters. Um, 205 is quite a good one. So I can print the character 205. Uh, and it, it, look, it looks like a backslash. It's not actually a backslash. It's like a, a, a graphics character that fills up the entire character. Oh, God, I hate having to do this all the time. I wish I'd, I should just add a run stop key to my computer and I just tape it on the side. Right, so now I can actually use, uh, a, well, I can do 205.5 plus RND1. So now it gets rounded down to either 205 or 206, and you get this. Yeah. Yeah. Wait for it. <laughs> There we have some digital arts, ladies and gentlemen. Right, so now, <laughs> yes, I can say thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> that wasn't long enough applause. I didn't get enough time to drink. Hang on. Right, so you might obviously think, wow, Seb's such an amazing digital artist. I wish that maybe one day I could. Uh, um, <laughs> learn to do graphics programming like this, but I've got a secret for you. Like, obviously, it's nothing special, really. And back in these days, you'd get a computer and you'd learn to program, and there'd always be these little graphics examples. In fact, this example, I didn't invent it myself. It was actually in the Commodore 64 user manual, this example. So not only did you get a computer to learn to code, there would be, like, generative art in the user manual. Like now it's like, oh, generative art. But back then it's like, hey, do this cool thing and stuff happens. And basically my whole career has been the same ever since. <laughs> so there is actually a, a book about this program. Have you, has anyone seen this, the book? This, do you know what it's called? It's actually called, the book is called 10 print CHR dollar brackets 205.5 plus RND one close bracket semicolon colon go to 10. And it's highly recommended. <laughs> uh, it's a, a curated set of examples. It also looks at the sort of history of, of, uh, of, of this, you know, this kind of early programming experiments. There it is. You can get it on Amazon. I highly recommend it. It's absolutely brilliant. Now, I honestly, genuinely, it's a really, really good book. Right, now I might just switch off. Oh, no, that, did that work? Yes, it did. OK, so as I said, everything I do is, is made entirely with code. So I don't really, I don't really draw pictures. I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't use After Effects. I, I literally, everything I make is, is with code. Um, so I'm going to sort of give you a few examples of my projects and the sort of thing that I'm talking about. So I'm going to start with Pixel Pyros, which is a digital interactive fireworks display. We have this massive screen. It's about 20 meters wide. And along the bottom of this screen, I project these lights. And all you have to do as a member of the audience is walk up to the screen after queuing for ages, because it's really popular, uh, and touch these lights, and fireworks come out. Right, so nothing happens until, uh, until the audience actually interacts with it. Um, and there's the screen there. It's, it's pretty massive. I did it for the first time in 2012. Uh, so obviously, my talk's changed since Dusseldorf, right? Because I did a new project, so that's good. Uh, something new to talk about. <laughs> um, but um, So I did it for the first time at the Digital Festival in Brighton in 2012. And uh, I thought, well, I don't really, this is brilliant. I don't know how to top this. Um, but then I realized, well, I could add lasers. So um, I spent the whole of last year, 2013, learning how to use lasers. I bought a laser uh, to play with at home, 
Uh, it's, it's only a one watt laser. There you go, there's one of the very early tests I did, uh, which was just to see, well, how many sort of points could I do particles with my laser? So that's, that's what this test was all about. Now, this laser was, like I say, is one watt. It doesn't sound very bright, does it, one watt? No? Well, to give you an idea, like this laser, obviously this is a cool laser, uh, this is half a milliwatt. All right, so my one watt laser is 2,000 times brighter than this. Um, oh, it really hurts your eyes. Uh, you can properly blind people with this laser. It's like a ton of health and safety. Anyway, I digress. I was learning how to use it, and then the second example here, you can see the, um, how exactly I'm drawing all those particles, because the laser gets moved around with these tiny little mirrors. So the mirrors move really, really fast. So it's the equivalent of me doing that really fast to draw pictures. Like, the mirrors do that for me. And uh, if I turn the laser off while it's moving, then you only see the spots of light. One what was cool, um, but I didn't think that would be big enough for outdoor events, so I made friends with some laser people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they have 11 watt lasers, and uh, I got very excited about their 11 watt lasers. Whereas my one watt laser can blind people, um, their 11 watt laser will actually burn through stuff. <laughs> uh, so that's even better. So this is the 11 watt laser. Uh, you can't really get a very good impression. This is just me testing it out in their office. And we're projecting a sort of test image uh, for us to sort of get a sense of the scale and stuff. And you can see that 11 watt laser is making those bright spots of light. You just can't really get the impression of how bright it is here, but trust me, it was like lighting up the entire room. It was so cool. So here's the, uh, the lasers in action. I'll show you a video in a moment as well. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how the interaction works. It's actually a very simple system that uses infrared cameras. The first stop on our tour was in Nottingham. Oh, I went too far. And you can see here that there is a view from the infrared camera uh, so the infrared ca I use infrared cameras because if I didn't use infrared cameras, the cameras would see the stuff I'm projecting and the projections would interfere with the camera. You know, I'm just using motion detection on these cameras. So you can see the image there. We got a load of LED infrared lights and put them behind the screen. And this was the first, time, the first date on our tour. So as well as adding laser, I don't know if I mentioned, uh, we, we took it on tour to five dates around, around England. And uh, yeah, this was the first one. And we actually had a load of problems because the lights just weren't very good. And you can see it's really noisy. We just about got it to work OK, but it was a bit touch and go. So I thought, oh my god, I'm going to have to get some new infrared lights. So of course, I spent 2,000 quid and got a load of infrared LED strips from America. Um, and you can see there, that's what it looks like in a normal camera. And this is what it looks like in an infrared camera. And you can tell it's really bright, because even in full daylight, it still just like glares. And I realized I wasn't even using the right power supply. So that's like half as bright as they go. So we cut them up into strips, waterproofed them, set up some power supplies. And that was what the, uh, the actual view ended up being. So a lot, a lot clearer, as you can see. And here's the video. So this is the, uh, the, the first stop on our tour in Nottingham. I just said that. I just said that. There's one of the projectors. We used two big projectors. There's the screen, obviously massive. It goes up on these scissor lifts. Uh, that was the infrared cameras you just saw. We rig up the screen with uh, just cable ties, actually, but that's, that's for safety reasons, because it could blow away. Uh, that's a laser. <laughs> that's pretty cool. The laser. You know what, like last week I did a conference in Cardiff, the web is, and uh, because I talk about lasers quite a lot, someone said I was like the 70s spaceman on the Lego movie. Have you seen the Lego movie with the, the spaceman? And he's just going, spaceships, all the time. And they're like, you're like that guy, but with lasers. Um, so yeah, lasers. Um, yeah, so you can see all the different fireworks styles. Uh, there are lots of different styles of fireworks. That one's like 8-bit low resolution. The one before that was more like graphics, the sort of vector graphics like Tron. Um, and then, of course, this, because this was Game City in Nottingham, we thought, well, we should probably add a game. 
So the biggest Space Invaders game ever, with about, I don't know, 600 in Invaders, I think. Always add a game to your projects, that would be my advice. Always add a game. Uh, asteroids as well, you can see the, the bullets there are the lasers, that's why it goes a bit flickery, it, it interferes with the camera a little bit. Um, but the lasers are really good at making like bright spots of light. And because this was the first stop on our tour, I was just getting started with lasers. By the end of the tour, there was just lasers everywhere, it was absolutely ridiculous. Um, but they're really good. You can see the sparkles there, the little crackles of light. Laser's really good at that. Anyway, I'm going to move on to my next project, Laser Arcade. So in 2013, I learned how to use lasers. And so now I just want to use lasers all the time because it was really hard to learn. And, uh, and so I don't want, you know, well, I mean, you would, right? If you learned how to use lasers, then you just want to use them all the time, right? No? Just me? No, it is you. OK, good. Laser Arcade. So the idea behind Laser Arcade was that I would wanted to make this uh, a shooting gallery that used Nerf guns, you know, Nerf guns with the sponge darts, um, but firing them at, like, laser-projected targets. Yeah? Whoa, I just noticed these guys. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, sound good? Yeah, Nerf guns. Are you into Nerf guns? They're not. <laughs> Everyone is, right? Anyway, the biggest problem with this project was knowing where the Nerf gun bullets hit the wall. Anyone got any ideas how I would do that? How would you know where the Nerf gun bullet hit the wall? Anyone? Anyone done anything like this before? A connect. A connect? Yeah, a connect probably wouldn't work because the Nerf gun bullet is so small and it goes so fast that it, the connect just wouldn't have time to register. Not a bad idea, though. Anyone else? An eye beacon. <laughs> yeah, wait a second, wait a second, it's connected. Oh, it fell down. Uh, no, not an eye beacon. Well, in the end, I used sound, which was probably a crazy idea. It was my out there idea. But anyway, I had some microphones, an array of microphones around the board, and uh, I measured the amount of time it took for the sound to reach each microphone. And you can work backwards, backwards from that. The maths is killer. It's this technique called multilateration. Here's the maths for it. Yeah, it's sort of a known thing, because the military use it to pinpoint sources of like radio signals and stuff. I know some military stuff I don't get. So uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, um, I, I could, obviously, I'm not a mathematician. I can't read that. Shit, I'm just, no way. Um, but in the end, I, I used a sort of more physics-y sort of spring-based simulation. Come and talk to me about it later. I'll show you some examples. It'll be really fun. Uh, but anyway, here's Laser Arcade. You can see here. Uh, this is just my one-watt laser. It was part of a, um, a residency in Margate, and they have a games uh, ex uh, exhibition there. So you can see that those, those, that's actually firing real Nerf gun bullets. And you can see I do a little laser particle burst when it hits the, the thing. And we've got all these different games. Ironically, all right, here's, here's a really good lesson. Ironically, I, I made all these games like with bottles and asteroids and ducks. Admittedly, they were similar, a similar theme. Uh, <laughs> But in the end, the most favorite game was just like the shooting gallery with the practice, target practice, which was just like the target, like this one. Um, I don't quite know why. We spent an entire week, weekend picking up those bullets. You can see there the system of microphones. So that's some debug data that I'm looking at. Oh my god, I'm sick of those darts now. All right, I'm going to skip past. I'm running out of time. Smashing Conference, a very, another very good conference. And uh, uh, my good friends there just wanted me to do something cool for the, for the intro at Smashing Conference in Oxford. Um, like, you know, in conferences, you usually have like a, an intro animation, like, like with marks just now, very nice. Uh, we thought, I was working with Valhead, and we decided, wouldn't it be cool to have like an intro animation, and, and everyone would be like, oh, yeah, it's a nice animation. And then, like halfway through, just break out of the screen with lasers. <laughs> yeah? Oh, sorry, I, did I mention I was going to use lasers a lot? 
All right. So here it is. Uh, you can see the beautiful venue in Oxford, the town hall there. Uh, and you can see this is a little way into the animation. It's like, yeah, oh, some nice animation things. Oh. And everyone's like, oh, that's all right, I suppose. A bit bored. Is anything out? What's going to happen? I wonder when I'm going to get to the talks. And then it's like, oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Might need a bit more music. Can I have a bit more music? No. <laughs> oh, and uh, there's a pipe organ. So obviously I had to turn it into a graphic equalizer. I don't really feel like that was really an option. And we, I mapped the entire like dome in 3D as well, so I could make things look like they were they were mapped onto the dome and sort of breaking out of the dome in 3D, like like this. Can I have some more music, please? Is the, the fadey thing you want to push it up a bit? No? no. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't speak English, does he not? <laughs> I don't know what it is in German. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not going to try it. It'll just be embarrassing. OK, so this was a um, smashing conference. Now I'm going to talk about my other project. It's probably the biggest project this year. Um, and you might not be surprised to hear that it had lasers. Uh, it's called Laser Light Synth. So I kind of thought, I used to be in a band. I know it's hard to believe in now. I look so businesslike and uh, corporate. But uh, in my 20s, I was in a band. And we kind of nearly got somewhere. You know how it is. You always nearly get somewhere, right? And then, then you give up, and you get bitter and become old. Anyway, um, so with, um, I thought I loved being in a band most of the time when I wasn't carrying all the gear. Never quite was successful enough to have roadies. Um, but I thought everyone wants to be in a band, right? Everyone wants to be in a band, right? Who wants to be in a band? Everyone, yeah, exactly, thank you. <laughs> thank you, that's my point, exactly. Everyone wants to be in a band. Um, but most people aren't in a band. Why, why is that? Why aren't most people in a band? No talent. <laughs> is that what you said? Because <laughs> no talent. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be quite as uh, crude as that. The real, I mean, I see it as it's just really hard, right? It's hard to be in a band. It's hard to learn uh, a musical instrument. It's, it's, it is. It's hard, right? Do you know why it's hard to play a musical instrument? Well, there's a lot of notes, isn't there? A lot of notes on most musical instruments. And... Um, most of those notes are wrong. Um, there's only a few right notes. Um, so I thought, wouldn't it be cool to make some musical instruments that anyone could play? So I just took out all the wrong notes. And the, the musical instruments then just could play the right notes. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun, these light synths, like these little synth, well, quite big synth things like this, totally covered in super bright LEDs, and they've got a touch surface. So you touch them, and all the right, right notes come out perfectly in time as well. It's two things about being, playing an instrument. It has to be the right notes and in time. If I fix those things, then anyone can be in the band. So I made four of these synths. Anyone could come and play them. And while you played them, lasers went up the columns. <laughs> uh, you can see one of the synths there. Oh my God, 729 super bright, individually addressable LEDs on each one. That's a lot of wires. Uh, and also, God, they're just so bright. It's like, are they as bright as those ones, maybe? I think they're brighter than those, even. So I just had, like, retina burn, like, the entire two months. You can see me making them there. That's how I did it. I've got some acrylic sheets and... Uh, and these, these RGB LEDs, they're the WS2812B LEDs. I'm sure you're interested in that, everyone here. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. That's my favorite LED. Uh, it's quite good because you can control a whole string of them with just one data line, and each one is individually addressable, as I've probably mentioned. Um, aluminium frames are probably the most sort of rugged thing I've ever made. I worked with an engineer quite a lot, and he helped me to, to make sure it didn't fall apart. <laughs> and it was waterproof and stuff like that. 
honestly, so much work. Oh, and there's the touch sensors. I cut out those copper uh, tracks with a vinyl cutter. And of course, they had to be perfectly lined up. It was, you know, it was such detailed work. I really enjoyed it. I was just spending like hours and hours like lining everything up perfectly. Oh, so good. You know what I mean, right? Yeah? You know that. It was really hard, <laughs> but it was really cool. There you go. You can see them um, coming together. The one on the right was my prototype. The prototype took me like a day to make. And those synths, it took like two months. There's like prototype to finished product. So that's like a long, a long distance, isn't it? It's very far. Uh, there you go. There's the finished one. We even got laser cut aluminium end plates. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, and there you can see someone playing them, right? Have I got a video? Oh, look. kids loved it. Everyone loved it. It's just like lights, yeah, no wrong notes, brilliant. Here's the video. Probably won't be able to hear it. Can we turn it up, please? <laughs> can someone tell me how to say to... Oh, there you go, right, excellent. We got some volume. So you can see, yeah, that's the notes, and, the, and as, the, as you play it, like the particles fly up the wall. Um, each one was a different sound, so I had bass and strings, and one was like an arpeggio type thing. Like you'll see that in a minute. This, that was Jeremy Keith. Did you see that? Going mad, playing. Look, this one was like the arpeggiator, and these two guys just got so into it. It was amazing. They were serious, seriously into it. Look at that. It's like, look, we're in the band. Yay. I always wanted to be in the band, but I could never be in the band. And then I did sort of like solo spots as well. I was like, hey, have a solo. Yeah. Amazing. I'll tell you what I love oh. is this is completely freestyle. Freestyle. That's great. Yeah, really, 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 really well put together. Oh, even the geeks liked it. Is that one there? I've never seen anything like it. I would hate to say that. But it turns out it's a bunch of random people, so I'm really Did you hear that? He said, I thought it was craft work, but it turns out it's just a bunch of random people. <laughs> so, that's my favorite quote. Okay, excellent. That's uh, Laser Light Synths. Um, oh, thank you. I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> 10 minutes. I thought I had 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm just negotiating with Mark here, hold on a second. So what are we saying? I've got 15 or 10? 15? I still haven't got enough time, it's irrelevant really. Um, have I got time to talk about Lunar Trails? I'll give it a try, I'll do it quick, shall I? Lunar Trails is a project based on this game, Lunar Lander from the 70s. This is actually my arcade cabinet. It was one of those things that you buy on eBay late at night, $1,000. I've never seen it, it's in LA. Uh, maybe I'll get it over once. This is what it looks like. Has anyone played it? You can play it if you want. I'm just going to turn mirroring off. Uh, you can play this game online at moonlander.seb.ly. There you go. Usually I would play it, but I've, I haven't really got any time, so I'm not going to play it. Anyway, I decided, wouldn't it be fun to make this into a multiplayer game? So I watched, I, I set up the server, and every time someone plays it now, they're broadcasting their position to me. So I can spy on people playing the game. It's a bit creepy, <laughs> but it's fun. Um, like, go and play it now if you've got some cell coverage. <laughs> and if you did, then I'd be able to watch you here. Uh, and, and I thought, well, I'll just leave a trail as the people are playing, just so I can see what sort of what that looks like. And uh, and I left it running like overnight one time, and I got this cool image. There, I was like, whoa. I thought I'd just made a game, but I didn't. I actually made an art. It was good, right? So I thought, wouldn't that be fun to bring it into the real world? I couldn't get my actual arcade cabinet because it was in LA. Might have mentioned that. It's a sore subject. Um, but you can actually get flat pack arcade cabinets. Did you know that? So I bought an, a flat pack arcade cabinet and I recreated Lunar Lander. Look, I did metal work and woodwork. It was, it was yeah, pretty hands on. I played with motors. I could just talk to you about DC motors forever. Come and talk to me later about DC motors. I will be so boring, it'll be brilliant. Um, and here's the actual project. See, I need it quieter now. I'm never happy, am I? Right, 
So this was a huge drawing machine, yeah? So I thought, rather than just have it all in the internet, why don't I bring it out into the real world and make a massive drawing machine and the real cabinet so that when people are actually playing the game, uh, their path that they take is being plotted onto the wall. It's really hard, I might have mentioned that. So the hanging plotter was based on an open source drawing machine called Polygraph, and I bought the kit for that and ended up just completely rebuilding it with the help of my engineer friend again, because uh, to scale it up was actually pretty complicated. It's three meters wide, this drawing machine, but you can see it makes these wonderful pictures over time. And it was first installed at the Dublin Science Gallery and then subsequently went to Brussels and France. Again, just like all my projects, doesn't really do anything without people. I don't know why she's grabbing onto it. It's like, let go! Yeah, so all my projects don't do anything without uh, people getting involved, or most of my projects. Right, so that's Luna Trails. Creative JS are a series of workshops that I do, because obviously all this stuff that I do, this creative programming, I've done for years in many platforms, and in the last few years, it's been really easy to do that in JavaScript. So I've been running these workshops uh, which, uh, which basically teach all these creative graphics programming effects. And it's really good fun. You know, we do particle systems and games. And, and yeah, it's just a really wonderful time to sort of be exploring that stuff. And particularly now with um, user interface design being so sophisticated, a lot of animation now in user interfaces. And really, it's down to the programmers to make that feel right. You know, so in my workshops, I'll kind of show you the maths behind all of that smooth movement and responsiveness, right? I don't mean, I don't mean responsiveness, like opening and closing the browser. Like, oh, look, it's straight. No, not that. I mean, like, responding to, like, the actual meaning of responsive, right? There was one before, before Ethan Marcotte. OK. Right, so that's that. Now we've got a new thing to play with, the Internet of Things. Oh, I hate that term. Oh, things. Oh, thingies, right? It's a bit. Oh, it's a bit gross. Do you think I just think of thing? Things. Get it? What's the thing doing on the? You don't want a thing on the internet. So I've got a new term for the Internet of Things: stuff that talks to the interwebs. It's the new buzzword, or S T T T T I. <laughs> um, I think that's. Uh, it's totally going to catch on, honestly. So I'm, I'm doing a new workshop about the Internet of Things. I mean, S T T T T I. Um, and yeah, so oh god, it's just really fun. I love playing with electronics, like obviously with laser light synths and lunar trails. I've been working on um, electronic stuff for ages, so I'm really excited about getting this new workshop together. You get so much stuff in the new workshop. I'm making this little kit of electronics, like 200 quid's worth of stuff. You just get it in this nice box. It's based on the SparkFun inventor's kit, but I'm adding more stuff to it than that, loads more stuff like Arduino Mega, a Wi-Fi shield so it just connects to the internet by itself, a little motor, a display, LCD display, like, oh, temperature sensor, light sensor, buttons, they're nice colored buttons, LED of WS2812B, yeah? I think you, you recognized it straight away, didn't you? It's like, oh, that looks like WS2812B. Yeah, I love those LEDs, my favorite LEDs. So you get some of those. Uh, oh, a little 8x8 matrix, some ultrasonic sensor, a buzzer. That's a screen from the old Nokias. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's a massive 128 by 96 pixels uh, resolution. It's pretty sophisticated. Oh, you could make your own Back to the Future clock with one of those. Uh, RFID readers, oh, and of course, thermal printers like the, the, the Berg's Little Printer, classic uh, stuff that talks to the internet stuff thing. Yeah, so it's a really experimental sort of area. I'm really enjoying just playing around with it, making these things that are just a bit pointless, like this one that reads an API off the internet and checks when the ISS is going to pass overhead. And it just starts beeping <laughs> when, when the ISS is passing. It's really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, it needs some refinements, maybe. But that's cool, isn't it? Having this thing. It's not on your computer. It's not a thing. Stuff that can, whatever. <laughs> whatever, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, 
<laughs> we still don't have a good term, do we, for it? Anyway, I don't know. I don't know why I want that. It could be fun. It's, just, it's exactly the same as Creative Jazz, you know? We're just playing around with stuff. We're experimenting. We're getting some cool things uh, that may or may not turn into something sensible. Probably not, but we're going to have fun trying. Um, yeah, so that's my new Making Connected Things workshop. If you want to find out about that, uh, go to my website. Stay in touch, and you can find out. Oh, I'm terrible at saying things. Right. So now we get to the good part of the talk. It's like, yeah. It's like, I've seen a few talks recently. You know, I go to some conferences. And I've been doing them for a while, but I realized the other conference presenters, they'd like say stuff that meant things. It was really good. And they'd have like advice. And everyone's like, wow, that's really good advice. So I'm like, yeah, I can do advice. I'm going to do some advice. What do you think? Do you want some advice? All right, I might just switch off mirroring again, because that's how professional I am. Professional speaker, do advice and everything. Now, doing advice. All right, my first advice is learn new stuff. Yeah, that's a pretty good one, isn't it? Yeah. I love learning new stuff is what I said a few years ago at a conference, and then I realized I'm totally lying. I hate learning new stuff. Why do you hate learning new stuff? It's no fun, is it? It's really hard. You just feel like an idiot. Like learning new stuff, it's like, oh my god, you're that, what are you? That There's a word which is the most horrible word ever, and you're that, noob. Yeah, that's you, I'm a noob. Hello, everyone. I'm a noob. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing right on an internet forum. Sorry for the noob question. <laughs> and you just get silence. It's like the question is so stupid that no one, can, no one can even understand what you're asking. Oh, I hate learning new stuff. I just feel like such an idiot. But, you know, that's why most people don't learn new stuff, right? That's why, that's why if you're learning new stuff, you're like the only one, yeah? Because you keep learning it, and then at the end, you've learned it, and then you make something, and you're like, everyone else is like, oh my god, you learned that. That's so cool. So I don't love learning new stuff. I love having learned new stuff. <laughs> so that's, that's my advice there. Another advice for you would be finish your projects. OK, who does personal projects? Let's have a look. Who's ever done a personal project? Everyone, surely everyone. Keep your hand up if you finished it. <laughs> well, this front row, those guys, everyone else, not so much. So why do people not finish their projects? <laughs> it's really hard. Is there a theme emerging here? Um, it's because about halfway through your project, it's not fun anymore, right? It's just actually work at that point. And the other thing is, is that it's impossible to know how long a project is going to take. I can guarantee you it's going to take at least twice. Well, in fact, look at this. I've got some maths here. Last 10% of a project takes 90% of the time. I don't know what that means. I'm just saying the last 10% is really, really hard, and it's probably going to take ages. And at that point, it's not fun. You're totally bored by that point. It's just work. But of course, if you finish your project, then you're like in the top 1% of people. It can be a shit project. It doesn't matter. If you finished it, it's like you're in the top 1%. You're in these guys down here. You're in the VIP list, the VIP lounge over here. You didn't finish anything, did you? Not these guys. <laughs> Do you want to swap with these? These are the, these are the ones. Yes. Yeah, so. Really, yes, finish your projects. It's really hard, but it's so worth it. And especially if you've got a job, um, that, like, you don't have much time. And, and it's so easy to get these crazy, ambitious ideas. But you can do simple projects, right? Just think about are we in the future yet? Dot com. You know, I think that was me and Carl McDonald. We spent an hour or so working on that. That's, the, that's a great project. You can do that in, a, in an evening. Yeah, it doesn't have to be massive. It's too easy to get these crazy, ambitious projects. In fact, it's like I did this. I did a similar talk, not this talk. I did a similar talk last week in Cardiff, like I mentioned. And uh, and afterwards, 
I, I met loads of people, and every single time they were like, ah, oh, I really loved your talk, but I've got to ask, what do you do for a job? <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, maybe I should explain what I do for a job, how I actually do this. Well, right now I'm in the very privileged position. In the last couple of years, like these art projects, the installations and stuff, have started to earn me some money, right? Obviously, in the, in the years previous to that, I would do them just for fun or try and get you know, little bits of money here and there and, and put them on. But now I actually do earn money. Not, probably half of my income comes from those projects, and the other half comes from conferences and workshops. So, which is quite cool, because I, sp I speak about my work at the conferences and the workshops, so it's sort of very closely knit. So, I feel like I've given away a top secret there. So, I don't tell anyone. It's like, everyone will be doing it, and then I'll, I'll, no, no one will give me any money anymore. Um, <laughs> what am I even saying? I don't even know what I'm saying. Yeah, so anyway, finish your projects, because that's what I used to do. I used to, I used to run an agency, so I had a more traditional job, and I would just have to do all these things in my spare time. Of course, I just worked all the time. So if you want to get into this sort of thing, you just work all the time for a little while, and then maybe um, you can really work all the time <laughs> like I do. It's brilliant. Anyway, I've lost my point now. Let's move on to another advice. Yeah, you ready for the next advice? There is no such thing as a natural ch talent. Oh, I skipped on. It's <laughs> very unprofessional. I'm going to blame this. <laughs> oh, rubbish thing. Uh, no such thing as a natural talent. Um, you see people all the time, don't you? You're probably, over the next two days, you're going to see some like really amazing speakers, and you're just going to be like, those guys, so talented. I can never be like them. They're just natural. They're, they're just, how do they do it? They just do it. They're just natural. No, they're not. Everyone who is talented just works their asses off, right? <laughs> That's what it is. It's all about working really hard and being dedicated to something. I think any one of you could do really amazing things just if you applied yourself. If you just sound like your mum now, don't I? <laughs> if you just applied yourself, you could maybe get a job or something. Anyway, so yes, I always think it's attitude, not aptitude. And again, last week when I was doing this talk, this is like kind of my last slide, I think, if I remember correctly. And I was just, like I do, just talking around this in a sort of waffly, rather amateurish way. <laughs> and, and I said something, which was my final closing thought for the talk, which is, there is always someone better than you. <laughs> And everyone, I saw it, it was like the most tweeted thing. Hashtag motivational speaker. Uh, <laughs> so I've, put, I've made it a slide. There's always someone better than you. Unlike last week, I'm going to explain what I mean. <laughs> what I mean is no matter what you do, no matter how good you get, there's always someone better than you but they're not like you. They are not doing things like you would do them. They might not be good at things that you're really good at. They might just be good at that one thing that you're not quite as good as them at. <laughs> yeah, so don't let it freak you out. Even like the most successful people will still be thinking, oh, I wish I was as good as them. So, yeah, that's kind of the end of my talk. If you want to find out some more, you can go to my website and my Twitter and stuff. It's been great to meet you. I hope I get to chat some more later. Ask me about motors, WS2812B, LEDs, and uh, lasers. And, uh, yeah, have a fantastic conference. Thanks very much, everyone.